Thank you for reminder, Akos. All right. Should I start? Should I start, Ina? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you again for, for the introduction and for also the invitation to, to have me here as a, as a guest speaker. I'm uh, yeah, very much obliged to do that. I like to do it with you guys. And uh, also, thank you for your interest in being here. Yeah, my name is Volker Wittig. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, actually, and uh, have spent a few years, over 10 years in the US back then, uh, working on some drilling technological stuff before I came back to Europe, to Germany, to delve into geothermal drilling application and developments. And that all happened here in Bochum, in the geothermal center that some of you may know or may have heard of that has been here almost 20 years. And then we changed it, or not we changed it, but we found it then the Fraunhofer IEG, where I know currently still involved in the development of shallow and deep drilling technologies and then uh, heading up the department here in Bochum. I'm now under Fraunhofer and not as a geothermal center before. Yeah, um, let's see that this works. Volker, just yeah. a, a small a small uh, thing. Uh, would you be able to, to talk a little bit more louder? I think you are talking on your speaker phones, right? Or oh, headphones? Can, yeah. can you hear it? Yeah, it's just when you move head a little bit that uh, the quality is not perfect, let's say. Okay. Yeah. So uh, a little bit louder if possible. Yeah, very appreciated. Thank you. Okay, thanks for letting me know. <clears throat> let's move to the next one. Uh, someone that... No, the Does it work? No, not right now. Okay, let's try to share it one more time. Maybe stop sharing and then one more time. Let's see where this it works. worked five minutes ago, people. So yeah, we expect it to be again the case. Okay, perfect. Okay, maybe I have to do it with the mouse. Okay, that works. All right, so sorry about that. So now we are working within Fraunhofer, and again, a lot of you or most of you will know about Fraunhofer in Germany. It's the biggest, single biggest research uh, institution or alliance uh, working in applied research between university and industry application. And uh, we are altogether about 30,000 employees uh, overall in Fraunhofer among we have about 80 institutions, and so we were founded here in Bochum uh, in this institute then three years ago. We changed over from the Geothermal Center into Fraunhofer IEG, as it's called. And uh, this is our institute now, Fraunhofer IEG. We are uh, well over 200 employees now already, two directors, and we are very much present in the West here in Bochum, Aachen area and also in the east, uh, Zittau and Postbus area connected to the Hochschule of Brandenburg. And also we are now setting up a center in the south in Holzkirchen, uh, dealing there, especially also with the application in southern Germany, in the cluster base. Uh, a little bit more look inside our Fraunhofer area now. This is what we do within Fraunhofer IEG. This is the Institute for Energy and Geothermal Resources. So what we did in the past was very much centered here in uh, this uh, part, in this block, in the geothermal center. We worked a lot on geothermal energy, geotechnologies, and, and, and also geothermal resources. And now within Fraunhofer IG, we expanded our envelope quite a bit also into hydrogen, work on hydrogen course, uh, energy infrastructures overall, and then also on thermodynamic converters, including heat pumps, heating, cooling networks, and uh, also then about smart and digital grids, uh, controlling the energy and regulations, automation, and all of that. So now the part we that used to be very much the focus of our institute you now has become also larger. Uh, 
quite a bit larger. Like here, you see a picture in the inside part of all there. Uh, you know, but we added a lot more stuff and also know how within the institute. And this is where we are in Bochum. Uh, our Bochum campus, uh, as we built it up about 10 years ago, actually, we uh, managed to set it up with our own geothermal system. Actually, back here is our drill and test site. And this is where the headquarters now for the IG, uh, for the IEG. And this is also where I'm sitting in this building. And this is very much our down hole, also drilling lab and development area here in Bochum, as it was before it remained all here. And uh, <clears throat> within our group, within my group, Advanced Drilling Technologies, uh, we have three drilling groups now within Fraunhofer. One is the applied drilling groups running really our rig and then and, and drilling actual holes. And then we also have one group now that is more drilling engineering and planning uh, for deep wells. Uh, people that have been in oil and gas before and then my group is still very much focused on developing new drilling tools new way to break rock you know you see here our main research point today we will talk very much about percussion drilling and uh, also um, acoustic based drilling control artificial networking uh, becoming a big one for our downhole monitoring our downhole processes that we are developing. So why do we need new drilling technology or look uh, to develop it better? Most of you know it, you know, we have still low rate of penetration, could be a lot better. We have to drill harder and deeper, typically for geothermal, the, the tool wear is high and also, uh, you know, the monitoring systems are not that good. So it all makes for, not so cheap uh, drilling, so to speak. And this is why we still work and uh, try to develop a better for purpose drilling technology. And in this part, we will focus on hammers drilling. And we have basically two options for that. Look at air powered hammers that you see up here or water powered fluid powered hammers down here. And uh, I'm sure you are familiar with both types of them. And air powered hammers uh, have been around a long time, proving actually how well they can drill, how efficient they can be, and uh, how, how much they sped up drilling. But on the other hand, they have a few deficiencies. That's why for deep drilling, we are after hydraulic or uh, liquid powered water uh, hammers. So, gas is compressible and much lighter, lighter than uh, water. Or other fluids, other reservoir fluids. That's why the depth uh, capabilities are already limited from air hammers. Uh, plus, we have a lot of high, very high expansion rates. And for cutting transport, we also have issues with air hammers. You know, bringing up high speeds in the annulus in the annular area, or we do have problems getting the cuttings out properly. So. Those are all factors where air hammers are limited to where we can use them and to what depth. And uh, the other part is between air hammers and water hammers. Uh, looking at this chart that we derived from a test drilling scenario uh, that happened in Sweden in 2007, where we were drilling on a two bore fields side by side with a pneumatic hammer and with a down hole air hammer, atascopo air hammer, uh, water hammer, basara water hammer. Those were all shallow drilling holes, some of the maximum 220 meters. And uh, so you see here a gray block and a blue block. Gray is for diesel, blue is for water, and the air hammer only needs diesel, no water, but therefore it needs a lot of diesel and the water hammer needs water and a little diesel. And that was just uh, trying to measure out you know, the, the, the energy and the fuel consumption is. And this is what uh, what is known and is also becoming rather important also now in the drilling business, how much energy do I need to drill a hole? And that's where the, uh, the air hammers are not so good on that side. But on the other hand, they only need air, no extra fluids. 
if you have them available, of course, it's good. It may become a problem. And uh, so we have been drilling holes with water hammers also for, you know, I could say 20 years now. This is our project site in Bochum, actually, where we drilled our holes for our campus here for the geothermal uh, power supply. And we used uh, water hammer technology because we wanted to investigate it and just uh, become more familiar with it ourselves, even though probably PCD drilling would have been quite adequate. So we drilled with, together with Vatsara, with a Vatsara six inch hammer, we applied some research relation out that you see here with a sedimentation unit. Um, and we had another unit actually attached to it to try to come up with at least a system where we could recirculate some of the water to make already uh, drilling possible for deeper projects. Um, so, and still again, uh, hammer drilling was quite good because we came up with high ROPs up to one meter a minute in that uh, type of sedimentary um, rock types we have here. <clears throat> so that was quite good. And that was another first step into the direction of water or fluid hammer drilling. Other applications from uh, the past have been this one here in South Korea with the company Hanjin. They are also building water hammers and rigs and they also were there were very keen to use a hammer drilling down to greater depth of four or five kilometers. This is the chart, the ROP that you see here, uh, ROP against drilling depth, and you see it doesn't uh, taper off much anymore after certain depth, uh, like air hammer drilling, where hammer drilling typically goes down, still quite a bit more with, uh, with depth. And uh, the other thing is that uh, the ROP was still well over 10 meters per hour, 12 meters per hour for this type of drilling uh, in granite, eight and a half inch uh, open hole. So it was quite fast and good drilling. And also Hanjin tried some recirculation uh, and also some better cutting lift system uh, with. Uh, using compressed air within that system. Then another few years down the road, we were in Finland with ST1 uh, and the company Anga drilled a deep hole there for ST1 for geothermal use. And uh, the first top section down to roughly four and a half kilometers was drilled with air hammers uh, really and uh, just using air in uh, some form, probably at times. And uh, it worked quite well, amazingly well. So it was also some kind of a record for air hammer drilling, showing that it can be done. And it does come up with still some relative high ROP values, like here, even 10 to 30 meters per hour. <clears throat> so that's, that's quite very good. However, then at four and a half kilometer, that's or that could be the depth part with a hammer. And then the program was planning on continuing with fluid hammers because hydraulic hammers, they are not that depth dependent. They can be used to about any depth. So then within the uh, same project, some prototype percussion hammers were tried out uh, to be run beyond four and a half kilometer depth. And then as mud type, filtrous uh, viscous water was used. So not just clean water, but some uh, light, light viscous water to help for cutting transport. Uh, the hammers that were used, they had a few different kinds. One was from Australia, percussion system. Uh, so I just worked with their existing uh, rig and pump system. That was good and already positive outcome are that, you know, you are, feel like you're in a much safer environment, you know, less stressful, less air, less uh, dangers from compressed gases, lower air consumption overall. But uh, so this was all good factors and definitely prove again 
sorry, <clears throat> how, how well the percussion and fluid percussion system work. But the problem, one, one other problem with uh, hydraulic hams, actually the controllability and uh, to run them at the perfect, um, perfect parameters down hole in greater depth. Here you see a chart from drilling uh, in those wells up north and you see fluctuation of uh, the, here's a bit going down, uh, gradually working its way down. Then you see a chart of the flow rate, pump flow rate and the pressure in the pump. And you see how uh, irregular it is here in sections. This is a timestamp about one hour here in this uh, neighborhood. And this is the problem. Uh, one of the biggest problems they experience up there are uh, how to really run these downhole water or fluid hammers to uh, get just the working point right. And that is one more issue to be addressed with these hammers once you have some that work really good to also make sure you have a means to uh, run them at the proper weight on bit and speed to make sure they function right and give you their best efficiency. And this is what we address then in our geodrill uh, research project and EU uh, project with some other partners where it was about to, to, to set up this new drilling percussion based drilling system and us building a new hammer section and also uh, coming up with sensors and data sets uh, to be able to be connected to the percussion section in order to make sure that we have a good control over of the system to have a good uh, and efficient uh, percussion based running uh, tool for drilling the low wear and low tear and high uh, drilling output. So we set out to, to rebuild, completely rebuild a percussion system to make it uh, fit and more useful for um, the use of drill mud and not only clean water because that was then the main issue that is typically left with the fluid driven hydraulic hammers. And you have two options actually with those systems. You can build a flow through system that you see up here where all the drill mud and fluid uh, drilling fluid is pumped through the tool itself and as it flows through it activates actually the percussion section and then gives you the dynamic forces that you need for drilling or the other thing possibility is to have a, an, an external closed loop system which can be more plug and play where actually your mud flow powers like a downhole generator or PDM motor or and generates extra electricity or hydraulic energy uh, that then in a separate circuit actually uh, powers your percussion section. And that typically then comes up with a lot of energy losses and loss of percussion output compared to the flow through system. So we decided to stay with the flow through system for our solution and then uh, orient ourselves to these initial manufacturers and continue from there. And then there were some others in the past working on hammer solutions, all flow through hammer solutions, <coughs> whether it be in China, in the US, or in Klausthal, Germany, uh, starting with a continental deep drilling uh, borehole over 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in the coal mining business. So there were a lot of activities for downhole, also fluid hammer systems. And this is maybe the most widespread uh, tool in the industry. It's from Vasara in Sweden. And uh, we have drilled with this many thousand meters. And you see the basic setup here in a, in a view, section view. And you also see here many inside, uh, the many inside pieces of such a percussion system that uh, you need to make it work. <laughs> and especially uh, we looked at uh, um, the inside of it and how they work and how they fail. And uh, then we came up with a conclusion, well, we, we need the piston here. This is the piston that makes the hammer 
to what it needs to do, and then the pest needs to be controlled, and then it's also happening in wear and tear in the valve section. <clears throat> That's why we decided to really take a new approach on the valve section that you see depicted here. And we decided we need to get rid of it and find something better to control the piston it's still an axial percussion engine that we have piston actually moving up and down so that's something we need but we can find a better way to actually power it run it so we looked around in physics and then we decided we go back to the quanta effect that you see here that uh, actually gives us the possibility to use the fluid pushed along the surface at certain uh, speeds uh, to give us a way to control its path or act much like a fluidic switch on and off. And, <coughs> and that's what we then further followed and build a switch out of it like here. So these are the basic uh, hydraulic switches, corner base switches that you see the fluid is being pumped here into this channel and then it goes either right or left. And it does that. Uh, depending on how you set the whole system up. So you have only one part left and that is moving in the hammer. And uh, we were then looking for high flow rate for our hammer because we need a high flow rate and we don't need a high differential pressure. So we want to have as little pressure loss as possible. And uh, all the fluid we can have because for fast drilling, we generate a lot of cuttings that then need to be uh, lifted up at the same time. And typically, for example, with the Sara hammers, the flow rates were, were too low at full drilling speeds to really get the cuttings out adequately. And also, we are looking into variable frequency setups uh, to have a new good solution for down drilling system and so we set off and started working with switches and setting up uh, what we thought we need and we all first uh, set up a four inch percussion system and looked into the feasibility and this just gives you a little bit impression of how much work we did like all these switches here they are all very different in what they do how they work not how they work but actually the outcome what they do as far as switching power switching parameters, and, you know, but just looking at them from here, you wouldn't notice any different. That gives you also an idea how, how tedious it is to set up a good system with this. And one big thing is the inside of the switch. It's really the center focus part because it's the surface area and where the fluid dynamic and the really, uh, yeah, the salt of the soup is, so to speak. And, and surface quality is one issue, but also how to shape the surfaces. And that's uh, what we worked on and got quite some good results that we then ended up making into real metal parts that you see here. Uh, and still being worried about the surface area. And the first thing you see already here is that you don't see anything compared to before. And so we had to make things visible always after making the switches uh, with CT scanning to see what we had inside uh, to verify how the tool came out. And then we set it up back for, uh, to measure it back after running a few times to look at possible uh, wear and tear. <coughs> so these were basically in these three slides here, you see some the major developments that have happened you one doesn't really see so much but believe me there is just a lot of uh, work and, and, and uh, development involved and then we set up here our own percussion system yeah this is like you see here it all happened that low pressure air is initially just using uh, plastics using uh, very rapid prototyping uh, to make to come up with a with a system that works well because one thing is having a switch that works and the other thing is uh, connecting that wants to put it that it down here and this ensemble work together in a way to work the way you want it that whole quick uh, setup would work here this 
fluid that exits the whole system. It's uh, typically what you then feed out uh, the exit of your drill bit and goes back through the annulus and up the hole. This one for types in that was I think last year at the geotan in Offenburg. So that was uh, what's inside of our new percussion system is, uh, and then the other part was of course to have a kind of forecast of what will happen when you pump anything else and water through it, especially dirty water, mud, drill mud, or even solids within the drill mud. So we started right away with solids. We just did a rough experiment, or actually a few of them here on our test bench, looking here into the <coughs> sorry <coughs> into the Vasara part. So we use the Vasara hammer setup uh, just to, to see uh, what happens. So we've seen it already many times. What happens when you pump dirty water through it? And then this is our basic percussion system as it is set up now just with a moving piston inside a barrel and very simple parts that are being uh, used to generate the percussion. And then the Vasara, it doesn't just like it, it's solids, you know, we know it and it pretty much stalls quite, quite fast when you, when you try this. And then our percussion unit, which doesn't need so tight gaps, it's built in a very different way uh, continue to run for quite a while with, uh, despite having sand and solids in the fluid. So it was a very good system. And then uh, we were also very well surprised, but it, it, uh, it's exactly what we are after. And then our field drilling test was also visible that using some bed night type drill mud was uh, no problem to run through the tool for drilling. So down the road, we then assembled the whole hammer system in uh, the same geometric size as other hammers. So it's a plug and play system to be attached to other drill strings. You see the housing here, it's a hammer housing um, from Drill King or Vasara from the company. And then we replace this inside part, this complicated top section with this a switch section that is yeah, not moving, it's a solid part. And then here is a hammer section, the, the piston, which is actually working in this anvil hammer housing. And here we actually have uh, yeah, inserted a box that is uh, capable of uh, being like a fast changing chamber. So we can actually insert different switches depending on what a customer may want as far as rock type or as far as bit type that somebody may use with a hammer or as far as frequency range goes or as far as mud type regarding the viscosity in the fluid. <laughs> so that's an idea to have be actually you know, in a position to kind of uh, give the hammer a special uh, yeah, fine tune to where it is to be used or where it wants to be used down the road. And also having the possibility of fast changing system for, for a wear part item. And this is the hammer section all set up together. So this is how it will be uh, inside the housing then working up here, the switch system where the control unit then sits and then, then the piston actually sits inside this section. And this is a view from our, one of our many tests we did. This is the new percussion we did with the, with the switch in there. And we actually had here only mock-up drill, but we were just not interested in drilling fast. We were just interested in run time and frequency and matching our piston stroke and frequency to get it in certain range where we want it. And uh, also, what the hammer tool or can also can, can run without weight on bit and with weight on bit. Typically, the other hands are set up that they shut off when you pull off bottom, which is also good and a good idea, but for very soft formation, sometimes that's not such a good idea. So we can also run the hammer 
the section without weight on bit. <laughs> so we also have the options there. Looking at the result of what we get from the percussion unit as it is set up now, uh, uh, these two important charts, frequency chart, uh, frequency over flow rate, and then the pressure drop, uh, the flow rate over the pressure drop. So one important thing is having a certain flow rate that we need here in the 200 to 300 milliliter range for a four inch hammer, uh, which is uh, at least what you want. This is our out of our early prototype setup, uh, coming up with a frequency range of 20 to 35 hertz, which is uh, that at that time. Uh, what we were looking at and uh, it worked quite well for us. The same thing with the pressure drop uh, being still quite high for us. I don't really like to be at that high, but we at least noticed that we have a very, very uh, yeah, influential parameter that is controlling our pressure drop and that uh, really the switch quality inside of our tool, depending on how well the switch is made or even becomes better as it is wearing a little bit because it will be cleaning itself more and more and then we notice that also the pressure drop goes down over time yeah. uh, quite a bit can go down significantly the switch wears down gets cleaner inside <laughs> the second part of the system <coughs> which I <coughs> mentioned earlier was the was a sensor and control part. And uh, this is uh, here you see the results of the other partners in our GeoGrid project setting up a data connection system, uh, uh, mechanical type contact based uh, connection from one side of the Drill string to the other through the tool joint here in the in the draw up situation here in the real made up um, first initial prototype tool joint with a brush system here and these were sensors that were embedded into the sensor hub to pick up vibrations and uh, other sensors depending on which one we put down hold to tell us something about the performance of the tool. And then this was all been tested early in the year on our drill site for drilling performance and investigation. Uh, and the drill string part that you hear is in a, just in a very early uh, prototype stage was something we really don't want to take to the field yet, but uh, for the as far as being able to hold up to percussion and make and break, it performed really very well. This is just assembly of the hammer section here. This down hammer section, we had stabilizers that were also equipped with sensors. And then uh, the data ready drill pipe was up here for, for the full field test. <clears throat> so uh, coming back to the percussion uh, system that we built, we set up a new mechanical based hammer design. Uh, for more durability and use of drill mud. We especially were keen on uh, avoiding rubber seals, so we don't have this uh, heel surface interaction, which also always had problems in these tools and uh, lead to downtime. We try to leave that out. We increase tolerances. We are not really... Uh, needing these tight uh, exact machine tolerances anymore that are very expensive and also typically lead to uh, low wear uh, to high wear and uh, low stand-up times then uh, simplify the mechanism reduction of parts you know, we drastically were able to re reduce the part in the hammer and we can even the mechanism in terms of frequency and impact. Uh, yeah, 
piston control with a hydraulic switch. We set up initial system one for four inch drilling. So this is the first setup and the tested frequency that we ended up with was around 36 hertz at 320 liters. And the differential pressure is still high. It's at the high end of things. So we expect it to be dropping down maybe close to 100 bars for these type of hammers. But uh, definitely probably not lower than 200 bar. It was typically then for five and a half inch filling. Uh, what we are also looking for some possible call tubing application with these kind of tools down the road for exploration, drilling, and fast, fast mining applications, <clears throat> especially with uh, flex type coil coils and also possibly medium deep geothermal drilling installations. And um, a for purpose development tool would be the next step for us. Uh, and uh, that's something we are currently in the process of doing. And uh, also being able to set up the percussion and drain the hammer relatively to the application, as I said earlier, geology and drilling fluids, uh, you know, can be the factors of them can be implemented to set up a percussion tool like that. So overall, those were the things I wanted to share with you and present you today on developments of the downhole percussion drilling, focusing on our new downhole and system. And uh, I think I'll leave it at that for now, and uh, then we have time for some questions, I hope. So I turn over yeah. to you, Rina. Very good. Okay, thank you so much. It it was a pleasure and a very nice presentation. Uh, I wrote already in the chat to people to to write down the questions. Uh, I don't see any any questions at the moment uh, written down. So it's not that many people. And if you want if you want to ask something, uh, maybe you can you can raise your hand and uh, and uh, react. So I will then try to unmute you. For now, uh, I have one question to to Volker, and it would be, um, which kind of do you see the increased number of companies very interested to to this technology, and what are the next steps in let's say implementing it and commercializing it? I think that's one of the let's say hot hot questions: how to commercialize it and and when are the plans so to say that it's widely available on the market yeah those are the two questions i probably would say yeah. so we are we are in, in communication with two companies actually also manufacturing companies about setting up a tool and making one and uh, building one and using it for more while drilling applications so far. So far we have just drilled in our backyard. And uh, I would expect that to go through a few iterations and to have then a tool that is readily available on the shelf uh, for general use. I would say that would be another two years or so, something like that. Okay, so yeah, uh, definitely, I, I think uh, it needs a lot, a lot of patience, uh, patience uh, when it comes to everything. And um, so, could you please just explain how how your team works? Uh, you are the team lead uh, at the moment of this of these projects, but do you have as well other people who are dealing with uh, that kind of uh, relationships with the, with the clients and and nurturing the ones, or is it again your task to do that? Well, the outreach to, you know, to to potential customers or clients or finding them, of course, everybody can do and should do in Fraunhofer and within other groups that do that. Within our own group, of course, I'm very much you know, probably the first one in the seat to, to do that, just maybe because I know the industry the best and people. But of course, everybody that's in my team, so especially for a little while longer and goes to conferences or something like that, you know, they are really, uh, yeah, not pushed, but it's part of that development, hopefully, you know, but the personal development to, to, to then also 
uh, talk to people and then potential customers to get to know the market, the applications. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very much the first the initial one doing this. And then uh, so far, I have actually two deep drilling engineers here. They are also drill, uh, learning Clauser, they're studying Clauser in Cambia. So they're also already quite good into diving in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's good to, to hear that. We have uh, one question from uh, Mr. Osman, and uh, he's asking, how would this application be different, if ever, in regions where hard rocks are re relatively shallower? In example, a very low thickness of overburdened sediments. In areas where I have shallow, or where I have hard rocks already in shallow depth, yeah. Okay. Uh, in shallow depth, and, uh, would be not any problems. I mean, you can run the tool in any depth. The, the problem with air hammers is you cannot run them in, in greater depth. But this one, you know, it's very much uh, depth independent. The, the mm -hmm. question for him in that uh, application is probably more, uh, you know, would he, from the, from the economic standpoint, uh, be also okay to just run an air hammer? The rocks are very shallow. You know, probably running an air hammer and investing in air hammer uh, is still a bit, quite a bit cheaper than fluid hammers than water hammers. You know, the 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 water pumps and rattle of pumps, it's not such an issue anymore. They are kind of almost not quite standard as air compressors, but uh, just almost getting up there. So, but the the tool itself. Typically, the air and the tools are, are still quite cheaper. But yeah, so when it's shallow, the rock, I mean, you you may be able to drill them with air as well, but, uh, you know, using water drilling uh, or fluid-powered hammers, of course, uh, then you're on the safe side that it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so Osman uh, is appreciating your answer yeah and thanking for for a presentation uh call out to everyone else in the in the call we have a few more minutes uh, please feel free to reach out to Volker um Volker also has here his contact if you want to discuss it uh further with him uh the applications in in uh, geothermal wells uh, I think it would be it would be beneficial for you then to reach out to him. I know that he will be very happy and as well welcoming to students' internships and uh, master theses and, and uh, PhDs. I know that, that you offered a, a very wi wide range at Fraunhofer from reservoir to drilling. And uh, at that time when I applied, that was in 2014, 15, I think you well, offered long, very, very interesting projects. It was a few years ago. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so please contact me if you have any questions or inquiries or something <coughs> about on hooker or drilling or something else. Geothermal. Yeah. Geothermal applications are really pushing now, but drilling is not the problem. Mainly getting the finances going and the risk assessment done right. Yeah, exactly. Main major drawback. Uh, right now mm. can you comment maybe the the uh, everything what's going on in germany now in in terms of geothermal and uh, collaborations of different companies and some you know, innovative technology what do you think where does everything go as so, so we see which direction everything is going but at which pace um yeah i mean we we came out with this little study that we did our roadmap for deep geothermal and ge shallow geothermal where we pointed out the potential and what we could need and use in the future but uh, now the, the, the gold rush the big gold rush has, has not really been started but uh, you know the inquiries definitely have gone up of uh, even small municipalities as they have to do their heat planning now in Germany. So that's a political decision. Each municipality, they have to do their local planning of heat. 
in their localities uh, how much heat they use. So there is already the, the reality that uh, everybody now has to start thinking about and differentiate between the kind of energy you would either need. And heat and cold is a big one, and then the rest is whatever industrial processes, uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And, you know that means everybody's thinking about it. And then the other, the other question is, we have a lot of questions, is, uh, you know, regarding how can you use geothermal. Everybody calls, how can I use geothermal in my area? Uh, so we have a lot of inquiries, but then things really getting done. You know, it's still very, very slow, uh, very slow uh, due to the, you know, two facts, the high invest and then also the shared risk, which is not there yet, you know, that we have a way to, if you have a dry hole in deep geothermal, that somebody does not go bankrupt, but that you have a system in place where it is you know, actually federally insured or something like that. The other one is now also the, the starting and additional production of uh, metals and heavy metals with the brines out of geothermal waters. Um, you are probably familiar with the company Vulcan that is uh, advertising everywhere mm -hmm. and also the Oberang um, quite active. We still have to see how much they actually pull out, but you know, adding some more value actually to the lift or to the to the mining of geothermal energy, which is a very low density energy compared to oil and gas. So, you know, it will just not be as, uh, as uh, yeah, will not give you as much finances or, yeah. or return of investment as fast as oil and gas did. And, um, and the other one is that we have, of course, Bavaria, Munich, the, and they're being our big, big showcase and they continue to be quite successful in expanding their their use of geothermal power there, which is very good. So that, that always brings a big push. And then also, as you have heard, probably the company ever launched their second uh, and now yes. largest project in Gerritsried. And I have to say... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's been just a bad cold. So, and they've been able to, you know, uh, start drilling already this year. And I, I hope that it may also speed up our process mm -hmm. for the rest of the country to what's the use of geothermal energy. Mm -hmm. We will see. But it took an ex external company, foreign company, coming to Germany. But they drum up their own money. They were quite successful in finding investors, so they were persistent enough. And now two rigs are running parallel to, to try to establish a good good deep geothermal system. Yeah. So what they do is basically they, do, they drill a lot of laterals and then they connect in the middle. And uh, this is how they um, optimize, so to say, the temperature, the, the heat, uh, uh, the, the heat the, in, exactly. intake. Yeah, so what, what ever actually promises is that they promise you an output of thermal energy because they are drilling a subsurface heat ex exchange system in a big yeah. way. So they, you know, that's what, what geothermal based on basically uh, getting out heat and therefore you need somewhere, somewhat of a heat exchanger. And that's what they're installing by drilling a lot of laterals, as Ina said. And they do it now in a special way using your directional drilling system that you know from oil and gas drilling, and also ranging pools that are there. So nothing new, but uh, they just use everything a lot into the limits to, to set up a uh, mm -hmm. heat exchanger system. And uh, that where they take the risk out of the geothermal as far as the flow rate goes because that's typically the highest risk what are we after in geothermal is two things it's temperature and then flow rate and from that you know yeah, thermal energy you get out and typically the temperature you can forecast more well more or less quite good you know one two degrees up or down 
but the flow rate can be from yeah nothing from yeah. zero to hero. It can be nothing, and it can be also right on or not. And uh, that's why they are just said, okay, we need to take that out of the equation and make sure we always get what we want. So mm -hmm. we decided to do the horizontal. Yeah, process. very interesting, interesting area that we live uh, in at the moment, I would say. We have a one question uh, which uh, is uh, pointed out to your uh, technology. And the question is, can percussive drilling be safely combined with PDM and MWD? And are the vibrations of percussive drilling impacting performance of PDM and MWD during operation? And are there any limitations there? Okay, combining percussion drilling with uh, MWD and, uh, and motor spectrum, basically. So that's why I integrated this in the, in the, <coughs> this performance, the development of our sensor subsystem, which is actually basically also for our MWD uh, setup to have drilling data while drilling and accurate drilling data from the from the direct BHA, not just collected on surface. So that uh, is basically also done to have rugged sensors, rugged enough sensors that withstand the percussion, the percussive powers. And also on the other hand, uh, the rotation units, we don't know yet. That's the next part we are after with the cold tubing drilling application uh, to have more the combination with the motor, with the downhole uh, motor drive. We have only initially tested it and it was, um, yeah, the results looked positive, looked positive. And the other thing is we have the ability to kind of uh, set up our percussion engine to be in favor of one or the other. We can make it more fast moving with slow impact or we can make it slower moving with high impact. And that mm -hmm. way we can also fine tune a, a, a rotation unit going with the percussion unit and make it a more efficient and longer lasting setup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, this will all be dependent on the rock at the end, right? Where do you well, do it? Then the yeah. feedback of the rock will also mm -hmm. be another yeah. parameter in the yes. mm -hmm. uh, Volker, are you going to be able to share with us some slides, uh, maybe partially or, or completely the slides that you shared with us? The audience asked about the slides and they would be it will be very much appreciated if we could could share it with uh, with you. Yeah, I would say yes for Probably ninety percent I can probably share. I will just okay. look at them very quick and then I send them to you as a perfect. PDF, right? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Um, just another question came in. Yeah, let's use a, a last last question for now, for for this presentation. What is the highest deviated angle possible to apply, and what the what are the limitation of DLS for percussive drilling? Uh. Same so far as what you expect from other uh, hammer systems so far. So we did not change that. And, and uh, as far as thinking into direction drilling, as far as uh, what DLS, how much, how little you can build up, you know, I would. Say we don't we don't know it we know we don't have it tried out but as far as the tool is built just from the geometry uh, it will not uh, be any worse than other tools because it's not longer you know it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't have an extreme length or something like that as far as um, within the within the rock breaking and drilling scenario with making the curve uh, in a shorter or in a greater angle that needs to be seen. But I would say within the same range as what, what people are used to now for percussion units. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope this answered all the questions that, that we had so far. 
uh, it was really a pleasure and always an honor to discuss it with you, Volker, and yeah, keep us posted on your recent developments. We are eager to learn and to exchange, especially, you know, it's a very hot topic at the moment. And, and yeah, we look forward to welcoming you again. And uh, we appreciate a lot your time and your effort to share your new developments with us. Yeah, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. My great pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I will stop recording now just for the case. And yeah, it will be possible. We will send you later the link where you can maybe have a look one more time, have a look at it.